Nightline begins now with me, Lena Hasnell. News making the headlines. Pro Lintas reduces toll rates at four highways effective Thursday. And choose budget 2023, not promises of moon and stars, says Prime Minister. Good morning. October 10th, the date Parliament was dissolved. The general election has to be held within 60 days from this date. Now, when will Malaysia vote? To determine this, the Election Commission, EC, is set to hold its special meeting on Thursday and announce the dates for polling and nominations. Will Malaysia vote on a weekday or on a weekend? This will be answered when the EC speaks to the media after its special meeting on Thursday to be chaired by its chairman, Tan Sri Abdul Ghani Saleh, which will be held at 10 a.m. at Manara SPR in Putrajaya. The date for nominations will determine the duration of the campaigning period. In the 2018-14th general election, polling was conducted on a weekday on Wednesday, May 9th, while the EC set a 12-day campaigning period. To be contested in the nationwide polls are all 222 parliamentary seats. GE15 is also expected to be held concurrently with the 2022 state elections of Pahang, Pera and Perlis. The automatic registration of voters came into effect late last year, following the unanimous passing of a bill to lower the minimum voting age from 21 to 18. With that, there are nearly 7 million new voters. In August, the Dewan Rakyat was told that as of May 2022, there were 21,113,234 registered voters, with 1,141,749 of them, that's 5.4%, being voters aged 18 to 20. The toll rates of four highways under the Klang Valley's largest urban highways provider, Project Lintasan Kota Holdings Sindran Burhat, Pro Lintas, will be reduced between 8 to 15 percent beginning Thursday. Pro Lintas, in a statement, said the toll rate reduction applies to vehicles in Class 1, which are vehicles having two axles, such as passenger cars and three or four wheels, excluding taxis and buses. It will also apply to taxis, which are Class 4 vehicles, and buses, which are Class 5 vehicles on the four highways involved. Meanwhile, the toll rates for vehicles in Class 2, which are vehicles having two axles and five or six wheels, excluding buses, and those in Class 3, which are vehicles having three axles or more, excluding buses, remain the same. The four highways with the new toll rates are the Ampang Kuala Lumpur Elevated Highway, or Akleh, the Guthrie Corridor Expressway, GCE, the Kemuning Shah Alam Highway, or LKSA, and the Kajang Dispersal Link Expressway, or Silk. The statement added that the reduction in toll rates is part of the government's initiative to lessen the burden of the people and the rise of living costs, as announced by Prime Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob on October 13th. The 2023 budget is a real fiscal plan catered for the people and not a manifesto. Prime Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob, who said this, stressed that unlike a manifesto, allocations have been set aside to carry out programs for the people. The Prime Minister was speaking at the Keluarga Malaysia Community Program in Tasik Gelegor, Pulau Pinang. Manifesto boleh jadi janji kosong. Sebab manifesto ini ada orang kata bukan kitab suci. Ha, jadi nak tipu bila-bila pun boleh tipu kalau setakat bajet, eh, kalau setakat manifesto. Tetapi bajet tak boleh ditipu sebab semua kewangan telah pun tersedia untuk kita laksanakan. Cuma beri kita beri kita kuasa semula, kita akan bentang semula bajet dan akan diluluskan untuk kepentingan rakyat di seluruh negara. Boleh? 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 Ah, kalau macam itu saya yakinlah. He said the 95 billion ringgit set aside for development expenditure was not to benefit tycoons. He said local contractors would reap benefits from projects, especially for rural development. Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri said of the 95 billion ringgit, 3 billion ringgit was for rural development. He said the government was committed to developing the socio-economy of Keluarga Malaysia, including improving the lives of the low-income group in urban areas. 
The decision by AMNO's leadership to call for the 15th general election early is the correct one to return the power to voters. Former Deputy Prime Minister Tun Musa Hitam, who said this, pointed to the nation's alleged political instability, which has harmed the country's ability to attract foreign investments. In a speech during a forum organized by the Johor Division of the Malaysian Council of Former Elected Representatives, Mubara Tun Musa said when he meet with some political critics, they will ask him what was happening to Malaysian politics now. He said that they have a perception that Malaysian politics had become like entertainment to them. The former Deputy Prime Minister said that Malaysia was really in need of a world-class leadership based on education, experience and one that is resilient and brave to face anything in the modern world. He added that it appeared that Malaysia is facing a deficit in top-class leaders that can steer Malaysia to a high level of competitiveness globally. Tun Musa added that Malaysia had a good education policy, a good economic policy, a good foreign policy, where the purpose was to create a united nation that can weather any challenges. Barisan Nasional BN, describing PAS as unfaithful, said it will reject any overtures from the latter after the 15th general election, GE15. The coalition's chairman, Datuk Sri Ahmad Zahid Hamidi, said past leaders were often fickle in their stance and had a tendency to manipulate Quranic verses and Islamic hadiths to suit their purpose. Bagi tahu pula, tunggu lepas pilihan raya, kita berunding lepas pilihan raya. PM jawab dengan tepat, pilihan raya lama lagi. Barisan Nasional menghadapi realiti sekarang. The BN chief was speaking at the gathering of BN Solidarity, Stability and Prosperity Program in Kulin, Bandar Baru. He stressed that BN only wanted allies who were loyal, loyal to the coalition. Last week, PAS announced that it would stick with Perikata Nasional and GE15, forgoing cooperation with AMNO and BN. Mampukah sejarah terlakar? Pada penampilan sulung Kuala Lumpur City FC. Perlawanan akhir Piala AFC. 22 Oktober di TV9, juga di saluran MyFree TV 109 dan Astro 149. The Royal Malaysia Police have yet to confirm the involvement of a foreign intelligence agency in the abduction of Palestinians in the country. Kuala Lumpur Police Chief Dato Azmi Abu Qasim said the police are still investigating the claim that a foreign intelligence agency, Mossad, was involved in the kidnapping of a Palestinian in Malaysia on September 28th. Elemen-elemen uh, yang ada dalam sesuatu itu yang melibatkan sensitiviti dan sebagainya itu yang menyebabkan yang tidak sewajarnya disiarkan uh, sekarang ini lagi dimaklumkan sekarang ini. Yang kedua ini isu keselamatan. Ya, uh, saya dimaklumkan oleh pegawai saya betapa ada beberapa saksi yang namanya telah pun disiarkan. Jadi ini uh, tidak baik dalam untuk sesetan kami. On Tuesday, the New Straits Times reported that the Israeli intelligence agency, Mossad, was the mastermind who hired local citizens to kidnap a Palestinian by the name of Omar Z.M. Al-Balbaisi Raida on September 28th. Home Minister Datuk Sri Hamza Zainuddin, when asked to comment, said his ministry was conducting an investigation regarding the report of Mossad's alleged involvement. The 31-year-old was rescued by the police on September 29th, a day after he was abducted by a group of men in a Toyota Valfire at Jalan Yap Kwan Seng. In separate operations by police, 18 suspects were arrested in Kuala Langat, Ampang and Buranang in Selangor and in Malacca between September 29th and October 4th. Last Friday, 11 individuals, including a woman, were charged in the Kuala Lumpur Magistrate's Court for kidnapping Omar to obtain information on software used to hack mobile phones. In the meantime, PKR has rubbished claims that a husband and wife detained by police over a Mossad operation in Malaysia were members of the party. 
PKR Information Chief Fami Vatzil confirmed the matter through a social media post on Wednesday. As for the pictures of the individuals hoisting the PKR flag or posting the party logo as their Facebook profile pictures around 2018, Fahmi stressed that these are the actions and choices made by the individuals and has nothing to do with the party. In a related development, AMNO Vice President Datuk Sri Muhammad Khalid Norden has urged the Home Ministry to provide an explanation regarding the expose of alleged Mossad operations in Malaysia. In a statement, he said the recent report has caused concern among the public and had brought about a security risk, especially since the matter involved the issue of national sovereignty and dignity. He also said that the government should form a special team to further investigate and examine the claim that Mossad have been recruiting locals to help carry out their operations. Yang Di Pertuan Agong Al Sultan Abdullah Riayatuddin Al Mustafa Bila Shah granted an audience at Istana Negara to two foreign ambassadors who will be ending their term of duty in Malaysia this year. The two are Saudi Arabia's ambassador of Malaysia, Datuk Dr. Mahmoud Hussein Said Katan, and his counterpart from Qatar, Fahad Mohammad Kafud, who appeared before the king separately. Mahmoud Hussein started serving in Malaysia in April 2017, and his term will end this October 21st. While Fahad Mohammed, who has served since November 2018, will end his term here this November 4th. Comptroller of the Royal Household of Istana Negara, Datuk Sri Ahmad Fadil Shamsuddin said that at both farewell ceremonies, the Yang Di Pertuan Agong expressed appreciation to both ambassadors for their role in strengthening bilateral relations between the respective countries and Malaysia to a more comprehensive level. Still to come, bomb blasts outside Myanmar's biggest prison. Stay with us. to the foreign front. Liz Truss on Wednesday insisted she would not quit as she faced questions from members of parliament at her first question time session since abandoning her disastrous tax slashing economic policies. The British Prime Minister faced hostile questioning from opposition Labour leader Keir Starmer, pressing her in parliament on why she should remain in power after a series of U-turns. Mr Speaker, I am a fighter and not a quitter. I have acted in the national interest to make sure that we have economic stability. Trust has been forced to hunt for deep spending cuts after the Prime Minister's now scrapped economic programme shattered investor confidence in Britain's government and sent borrowing costs surging. At least five Conservative Party MPs have already publicly called for her to be replaced amid catastrophic popularity ratings. Meanwhile, British inflation jumped back above 10 percent on Wednesday on soaring food prices, with the country gripped by a cost-of-living crisis bedeviling the government. In Myanmar, at least eight people were killed and 18 others injured on Wednesday, following two explosions at Yangon's insane prison. According to authorities, one of the bombs exploded in a building where staff received care packages for prisoners, and another detonated outside the building.
It was reported that among the dead were three officials and five visitors after the bombs ripped through the prison's mail room. After the blast, it was understood that several shots were fired by the prison's military personnel and that some of the people wounded had sustained gunshot wounds. Prison staff and couriers who were seriously injured were evacuated from the prison, while those not seriously injured were treated at nearby shops. So far, no group has claimed responsibility for the attack. In other news, South Korea claimed that North Korea has fired 100 more artillery shells off its west coast on Wednesday. This happened just hours after the North launched hundreds of shells into the sea of its east and west coasts in what it called a grave warning to South Korea. South Korea's military, however, said the shells did not land in South Korean territorial waters but fell inside maritime buffer zones. The incident marked the second time North Korea has fired shells into the buffer zones since last Friday when it shot hundreds of shells in its most significant direct violation of the 2018 agreement. Pyongyang has angrily reacted to the South Korea and joint military activities, calling them provocations and threatening countermeasures. Tens of thousands of civilians and Russian-appointed officials were being moved out of Ukraine's southern Kherson region ahead of a Ukrainian offensive on Wednesday. Russian-installed Governor Vladimir Saldo said about 60,000 civilians were expected to leave four towns on the west bank of the Dnieper River in an organized gradual displacement. More than 5,000 have left in the last two days as Russian forces have been driven back by 20 to 30 kilometers in the last few weeks. Saldo stressed that the pullout, along with the organized movement of civilians from the city, was a precaution. Russia took control of most of Ukraine's southern Kherson region shortly after invading in February and proclaimed it, at, it as annexed in September, in a move that Kyiv and the West denounced as illegal. <laughs> Badminton, the 2022 Denmark Open.
World number four Aaron Chia and So Wu Yik made a triumphant return two months after winning the world title by claiming a straight set victory over Germany's Marvin Seidel, Mark Lampfus in the first round. Aaron Wu Yik staved off a spirited challenge from their world number 11 opponents before prevailing 21 18, 21 19 in 36 minutes at the JISC Bank Arena in Odense. It was their fifth victory in six meetings against the German pair. The national duo will take on French duo Ronan Labar Lucas Corvi on Thursday. Moving on to football, the DFB Pokal Cup. RB Leipzig comfortably eased into the third round as they thrashed second to Hamburg 4 0. Leipzig took the lead three minutes after the half hour mark when Yusuf Poulsen tapped in Mohamed Simakan's accurate cross. Poulsen doubled the advantage three minutes later from a similar gameplay, this time Andre Silva the provider. The home side sealed the win in the 69th minute through Simakan's header following Emil Forsberg's corner, before Benjamin Henriks put the final nail on Hamburg's coffin, nine minutes from time following a quick counter-attack. After this breather, businessmen charged for falsifying customs documents. with more local news. A woman with the title of Dato and a male civil servant have been remanded for three days beginning Wednesday to assist a probe by the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, MACC, in relation to a case of allegedly furnishing a false document. Magistrate Nabiha Mohammad Noor issued the remand order until Friday on the two suspects, who are in their 30s and 40s respectively. According to Mlaka MACC, both suspects were alleged to have submitted a false letter of confirmation of the awarding of the state titles of Mlaka to the Council of Datos in an attempt to have themselves registered as council members. The duo were detained late Tuesday when they were giving statements at the Malacca MACC office to assist the investigation under the MACC Act 2009 for submitting or confirming documents containing false details. Police have crippled a wanted gang who was believed to be involved in 20 housebreaking cases in Pinampang and surrounding areas. Pinampang District Police Chief DSP Mohamed Haris Ibrahim said the three suspects, aged between 18 and 23, are all former convicts. And police believe the group has been active since January this year. <laughs> Kemudian mereka beralih ke uh, kawasan uh, rumah, uh, melakukan pecah, uh, pecah rumah ke atas rumah yang ditinggalkan sewaktu penghuni bekerja pada waktu siang dan juga melakukan uh, pecah rumah pada waktu malam. He said the suspects were nabbed in a series of raids in Pinampang and Kota Kinabalu. Following months of police investigation into the movement of the suspects, dubbed Gang Taufik. Items stolen include jewelry, electronic items such as handphones, iPads, computer tabs, and cash. Total losses were estimated at about 125,000 ringgit. Two of the suspects were found positive for drugs, and all three have been remanded for investigation under Section 457 of the Penal Code for housebreaking. 
A businessman was charged at the Johor Bahru Sessions Court on 11 counts of falsifying the declaration form for goods to be exported three years ago. 68-year-old Feng Seng, who also faces 11 alternative charges, pleaded not guilty after all the charges were read out to him before Judge Datu Ahmad Kamal Arifin Ismail. Feng, who runs a forwarding business, was charged with falsifying the declaration form with the intention of deceiving the Royal Malaysian Customs Department 11 times between August 9, 2019 and February 10, 2020. The charges were framed under Section 468 of the Penal Code, which carries a maximum jail term of seven years or a fine or both upon conviction. For the 11 alternative charges, he was accused of dishonestly using as genuine an invoice attached to the declaration of goods to be exported, which he has reason to believe to be a forged document at the same location and on the same date. The charges under Section 471 of the Penal Code are punishable under Section 465 of the same code, which carries a jail term of up to two years or a fine or both if convicted. The judge allowed bail at 10,000 ringgit with one surety and ordered the accused to report himself to the Johor Bahru Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission office once every month. The court set November 7th for mention and document submission. In Klantan, a laborer claimed trial at the Kota Baru Magistrate's Court to charges of beating his wife last August. The accused, 32-year-old Muhammad Asrul Kama Muhammad, pleaded not guilty after the charges were read up to him before Magistrate Muhammad Isdam Naim Che Ani. According to the charge, he was accused of committing criminal violence against his 25-year-old wife on August 15th. The offence under the Penal Code carries a maximum prison sentence of one year or a fine of up to 2,000 ringgit or both upon conviction. The court allowed bail of 3,800 ringgit with one surety. The court set December 20th for re-mention of the case. If you have a sweet tooth, Cake Lynn, an art gallery in Los Angeles, may be the place for you. The immersive art gallery is built to feel like a giant, dazzling, multi-layered cake, but it's made entirely of artificial materials. Let's take a look at the beautiful exhibition as we wrap up Nightline this time around. And with that, I'm Lena Hasanel. Take care and stay safe, Malaysia.